two. Let's get yeah. started. Uh, welcome everyone. I am so glad that y'all are joining us this morning for common formative assessments and common summative assessments. We are uh, going to learn a lot from these two ladies. We have Robin Dawson from Fort Smith Public Schools from Spradling Elementary. And we also have Faith Short from East Point Elementary in Greenwood. So uh, they are both model schools. They have a lot to share. And this is, Robin, this is your fourth year. Is that right? Uh, yes, I think it's either fourth or fifth. Yeah, I think fourth. Yes, fourth. And then Faith, what year is this for y'all? This is our fourth year together here at East Point. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. But are y'all in cohort three? We're in cohort two. We are in our third year. So you're in your last year. We okay. are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, they're going to share their what they have learned over the last few years of common formative assessments and common summative assessments. Uh, if you will go ahead and share the PowerPoint, and we'll go through the first couple slides, and then I'm going to turn it over to these ladies and let them share um, everything that they know, and then we will move forward from there, because I know I'm not the one you want to listen to. And I, I guess I should introduce myself. I am Missy Wally, and I'm the Director of Special Projects, and I have the good fortune of working with uh, some amazing educators throughout the state. So and these two being two of those. So they are also part of our statewide guiding coalition. And just to let you know, our statewide guiding coalition really was formed last summer to address unfinished learning. However, our mission statement has changed uh, to where we're addressing the needs or sharing the practices that we've learned. So it's one of those things that when you know better, you do better. And now that we know better and you can't contain the excitement because it's just, uh, it just kind of instills a passion about you and you go, oh my goodness, I've got to share this with everybody. And I, I really, when I started it, knowing that I called back to the school that I was an administrator at in Texas and I'm like, hey, listen, what I taught you was all wrong. We got to change, I got to change. <laughs> so um, it's some great stuff. If you'll go to the next slide and I don't know if we have our mission and vision. No, it's okay. not there. All um, right. And the, the other piece that I did want to share is just uh, before we move forward is where this stands on the high reliability framework, because we've got this framework, the high reliability school improvement framework, and there are five levels, level one being the safe and supportive collaborative school. Obviously with common formative assessments, it's got to happen in collaboration. Uh, so in level two, the effective teaching instruction in the classroom really looks at the individual teacher and they, they use assessments all the time. I know we as teachers, we as administrators, we use assessments all the time just to know where your students are at that time to drive what's gonna happen next. So, but using the common formative assessments is really on level three where it builds a, a guaranteed and viable curriculum. And then level four is your standards reference reporting. Uh, and you may get into that just a little bit. And then uh, level five is your competency base. So, just to let you know, right here with common formative assessments and common summative assessments, you're really hitting levels one, two, and three, and usually using those results for level four for your standards reference grading. So you're hitting all of those right there, levels in the uh, high reliability school framework. So just I, that is more of here's the work, here's the school improvement work and the framework of high reliability schools, and then how to get to that that uh, high reliability school is the how of the professional learning communities. I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, who's first? I didn't even ask that question. Uh, to Miss Dawson and uh, Robin, if you'll, and at the very end, they will stay on and answer any questions. If you have questions, uh, put it in the Q&A section and we will try to answer those along the way or we will answer those um, at the very end. And then also we are recording this and it will be uploaded to the PLC website on the DESI uh, or the PLC page on the DESI website. So, and you'll see all the other recordings from previous. So no matter where you are in the journey, you may go on there and um, pull one of those videos and watch those videos and uh, and contact any one of these administrators. I think their contact information will probably be on the last slide. Contact them, they will help you through this process. So we wanna uh, ride the journey with you. So 
Thank you ladies for presenting and I'm gonna turn it over to Robin. Hi, good morning. Good hump day morning. We're glad that you are spending some time with us today to learn about assessment. And I especially want to thank Faith Short that is helping me with this presentation. And Judy Dunmeyer also provided some of the slides. And so we're happy that you're here and um, learning with us today. All right. So the first thing we want to do is we just want to clarify what the types of assessments are and what they're used for. So there's common formative assessments. Um, those are just over the targets from essential standards where you break your standards down. The common formative assessments are over specific targets. They drive instruction. They let teachers know what to do next and where to go with students. The data that is gained from common formative assessment is used for prevention groups at tier one. Um, all of the, any kind of group that you would form from data from common formative assessments would all be tier one groups. So we call those prevention. The common formative assessments are team created and they are recorded um, and can be reported because, and that means recorded in your system of grading and reported on a report card. They don't have to be re reported on the report card, but at Spradling, at our school, we do utilize anything that is over our essential standards. We do record and report. So they don't have to be recorded and reported, but the other things are essential. Common summative assessments, which are different from common formative, they're over the whole standard. It's once you bring all those targets back together and they're over the complete standard. The common summative assessments are at the end of a unit of study or the end of a um, complete session of standards that you've taught. And that's where you see if students are proficient. That's where you look and see if they're proficient over those essential standards. Now, the data that's gained from common summative assessments is used to make intervention groups, which are tier two on the RTI spectrum. And so it's, it's a different type of group because you're forming groups over standards, not necessarily targets, and you have finished the unit of study, unit of study, whereas in common formative assessments, you're within the unit of study at the time. These are also team created and they are certainly recorded in the gradebook and reported on report cards. Then there's something that people use as a, a type of assessment and that's practice or homework. What you need to know is those are not assessments. All that practice or homework are designed to do is they are checks on the status of where students are in proficiency. Um, they can drive instruction, whereas if you see that students are struggling on practice or homework, it can let a teacher know what students need at the time. They can be team created or Individual teachers can decide about their uh, practice or homework. It doesn't have to be team created. And it can be recorded. It can be recorded as where students stand with proficiency, but you would never put uh, a, a grade from a practice or homework on a report card because they are not commonly developed and they are not over specific targets and standards. So those are the three types of things to just clarify. Now, when you're thinking about assessment, you wanna, you've heard this term, I've heard it for the last 10 years, starting with the end in mind. And so what you're going to do is you, the first thing that you have to have is you have to have your team has had to identify their essential standards. Once those essential standards at that grade level have been identified, then those standards have to be unwrapped into targets. 
So then you have the standard with the individual targets that have come out of that standard. So picture the end in mind for the assessment. Picture, use that picture to uh, incrementally identify what students should know and do. That's according to Kim Bailey and Chris Jackett, who are authors of an assessment book through Solution Tree. Um, so your assessment is going to be created at the beginning once you have essential standards and unwrapping. You don't wait till the end. All right, Faith. Um, short assistant principal at East Point in, in Greenwood is going to start taking us through the team teaching assessing cycle. Faith? So we're going to keep with that theme of keeping the end in mind and we're going to look at what this would look like all together as a big as a big picture. This is the team, the team teaching assessing cycle and it's found in taking action and when you first look at it it the diagram itself looks a little overwhelming. However, it's really pretty simple because for the most part, kind of along the lines of what Robin talked about just a few minutes ago, the bulk of this happens within tier one instruction. So this is really just the instructional component for those essential standards that your teams have already developed into a unit plan. So once we have made that plan, we move into the teaching cycle. And that's where we're going to actually introduce those learning targets. We're gonna begin that core instruction. And as we're instructing, if you'll notice, that's part of what's called the prevention loop that Robin talked about a few minutes ago. This is the, the point where teachers do this all the time. We have that instructional agility that we can formatively assess students, not common formative assessments, but we're gonna formatively assess students with things like quick checks for understanding, um, so that could be things that are as simple as, you know, one, two, three, show me, or thumbs up, thumbs down, exit tickets, bell ringers, just Q&A with students. It's even when you walk around and you're watching what students are doing and you're looking to see, do they have it or do they not? And all of that you're looking at and you're analyzing as you're seeing it to see if there are any cracks forming in student learning, because our goal as a prevention loop in the in this prevention loop is to ensure that we don't have that we're not creating large gaps in learning so we want to kind of meet those where they're at by shifting our instruction to meet the needs of the, of the students in our class in that moment in time so we do that continuously once we get to a point that we're ready to assess over uh, over a couple of learning targets then we're going to come together as a team and we're going to give a common formative assessment. And that is that um, assessment that's built by the teams. Every student has the same expectation. It's delivered the same way within a day or so of each other. We score it the same. Every single student gets the same exact assessment. And so we give that, we analyze it, to in turn provide those mid-unit interventions. So we look at it and that means still within tier one, we're going to maybe do small groups or we see, we may see something has gone terribly awry with our instruction because kids just didn't get it. So we shift our instruction again to meet the needs of the students. And we try to close those little cracks that have started to form. We continue that prevention loop until we've taught every bit of that core instruction within the unit. Once we have finished with that, then, and we've responded to our assessments, whether it's the formative assessments that we did individually within our classrooms, or it's the common formative assessment that we did as a team, we respond accordingly within our instruction. Then we give at the end of the unit, the common summative assessment. And that is when we feel like we've done all of the teaching in, in a, or done all the instruction on those essential standards that are built within the unit. And we're, we're done, we expect mastery from students. So at that point, we're going to come back together and we're going to analyze that end of unit assessment. And we're gonna look at those results to determine, are there still students that need additional support, additional time on those essential standards? Even drilling down to the point where we can 
get so specific that we're going to meet them where their need is, even within the learning targets. Some of it may be foundational even before that, but we're going to meet them where they're at. And that bumps to tier two. That's answering that critical question three. What do we do when students haven't learned? So they move to tier two, but continue tier one on the next unit of instruction. Okay, thank you, Robin. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, so let's, to understand common formative assessments just a little bit better, let's distinguish it from the other assessment types. Just like Robin was talking about earlier, our unit of assessment, our unit of instruction is sandwiched between a pre-assessment and a post-assessment. That pre-assessment is called those, that's to help us determine where students come into the unit, know where they're at in their learning so that we can actually start right where the need is. That, that end of unit is also called a summative assessment because it's going to, it's going to take everything that we've taught within the unit and we're going to assess over it. In the middle of all of that, we're going to give those formative assessments. It looks like a lot at the bottom, but it's really assessments that we just do on the fly, that we look and we and we are intentional, but we we don't have to plan as a team. We don't have to create paper pencil things. These are assessments that we can do quickly, just really kind of quick checks to help inform our instruction. Then we're going to have a little bit more, um, we're gonna do the common formative assessments, which are a little bit more, they're not quite as, um, on the fly, they're more scheduled and predetermined ahead of time. But, but those are to help us make sure that we are teaching and that our students are learning so that they can be successful on that end assessment because that's built upon the, the expectations of mastery. Okay, so when you look at all of that and you hear all of these different type of assessments and you see all of those pieces, it is not going to be uncommon for teachers to say, well, if you expect us to do all those assessments, when are we supposed to teach? Well, the important thing to realize is that in that assessment really is part of instruction. The majority of all of these assessments, the only assessment that is not used to inform us is the summative assessment. That's really going to, and even then it informs us, but it's really an assessment to determine where a student is in their learning. So that's an assessment of learning. Everything else is an assessment for learning and it's for our learning so that we can better meet their needs. It's also for students in their learning for them to inform them so that they know, okay, I didn't get this. So I'm gonna need to seek some additional support or some additional help from my teacher, or I need to make sure I ask questions. So those are informative, those are informed you know, they're there to inform both us and the students, okay? Even that, even so, until educators really learn the value of those assessments, we're still gonna hear them say, but why? Rick DeFore, and this, these are all points that were made in Learning by Doing, but Rick DeFore actually said that common formative assessments are the absolute linchpin of the PLC process. So, if Rick DeFore said it, it's the truth, y'all. <laughs> it, it's, it's critical. So these are some of the reasons why that common formative assessments are so critical. The very first one, when it talks about students um, or looking at promoting equity, that's so that we can ensure that every single student has access to the same grade level curriculum and expectations, regardless of labels, regardless of anything that follows them, any kind of, um, I, if it's an IP, if it's a GT qualification, it doesn't matter. Every single student is, they receive that same instruction and they are, have the same expectations. The next one about ensuring a guaranteed and viable curriculum, that's also just to make sure that regardless of what teacher or student has, every student is going to have that same consistent learning experience. Inform the practice of individual teachers. So a lot of the times we look at this and we, we take assessments and we think about where, where are students? 
the one of the most beneficial things is to look at the the practice of individual teachers themselves so that they can become better for students. The next one, a systemic response to students who haven't learned. It's that it's that answer to question three. How do we know when students haven't learned and what are we going to do? Question two and question three. How will we respond? And then the last one is just that changing behaviors in adults. When you work as a collaborative team, we make commitments to one each other to one another and we to the point that when we see when we see that we need to do better, we have to do better or someone else is going to come back and say, you know, why in the world aren't we do aren't you doing this or what my students still need this. We need to make sure that we work together to get to get this done and do the very best thing that we can possibly for them. So some of the misconceptions or misunderstandings about formative assessments and or common formative assessments. And one that I don't even have listed on here, and these are also from learning by doing, but it started with one of the very first things that Robin said. She talked about common formative assessments and that we, we utilize that data to intervene at tier one. A lot of times people think about a common formative assessment and they automatically take those results and go to tier two. The, uh, the formative assessment and the common formative assessments, they're to help us within our tier one instruction. How do we shift things within the instruction in that core instruction to make sure that, that we are not creating larger gaps and making sure that we are um, bridging any gap that we see in, the, in that moment in time. Another, another misunderstanding is that people hear the word assessment and they automatically think, oh, I'm gonna have to stop everything I'm doing and, and give a test and that's gonna take away from my instruction time. Most of these are going to be organic and built right in, it's gonna just flow very, very naturally right in the midst of your instruction. Another misunderstanding is that it's the content of the assessment or when the, when the assessment takes place to determine whether it's formative. The truth of the matter is that a formative assessment is simply what we use to improve student learning. And we improve student learning by shifting our instruction. So we, it determines our instructional next steps. He, here's This was something that is in Learning by Doing that really has stood out to me and I hear it a lot, but formative assessments are assessments for learning. So it's for us to learn from. And then summative assessments are assessments of learning. We're, that's when we are determining what has a, has a student actually learned what we wanted them to. And then the last one is that it's a tool for determining when students need intervention. That's true, but that's not the only purpose. One of the most powerful parts is that it's to inform and improve teacher practice. I actually saw a tweet that came out um, maybe last week and it was by Dr. Don Childress. And I'm not sure if she took it from someone or if these were her own words, but I thought it was really good because she mentioned, she said that if teens use these assessments for intervention purposes only, then your team is going to continue to see the need to intervene. But if a team also uses it to improve their practice, then the need for intervention will substantially decrease. We may still have to intervene, but the numbers of student work, students we're gonna intervene with will be significantly lower. So what does the CFA look like? Well, here's an example, but please keep in mind that not everyone is going to, not every, assessment that you build is going to look exactly like this, but we start with the learning targets because students need to know what the expectation is. So we start with the learning targets and then we build in that rubric so that students know exactly what's expected of them at each level. And then finally, we place in those um, task items. Those are going to be for every learning target or within the standard, we're going to put a task item because we want to be able to respond to the exact specific need that a student has. So the more targeted and focused we can get those task items, and that could be, doesn't necessarily have to be a, a um, project based. It can, sometimes it's okay to do multiple choice. Sometimes it's okay to do um, 
completion, there are lots of different ways to derive this information. So um, this is just a very, very basic format. So there's your learning targets that students have to know. There's the rubric. And then we have our task items. Whenever you're creating a common assessment, it's, it's so very, very important to not only start with the end in mind and build that assessment, but you have to de determine as a team, what does proficiency look like? What are we going to expect our students to be able to do? And in order to know that, some of the things you have to look at is you have to think about what's the knowledge that we want kids to be able to demonstrate? What are the skills they're going to need to be able to do? And what are the dispositions that are required for students to show proficiency? So to, sum it, to summarize common formative assessments, we're gonna look at the four critical questions very quickly, just because that's the work that, got, that these are the questions that got all, guides all the work within a collaborative team. So question number one, when we're asking what it is that we want students to learn, well, that's when we're going to determine our essential standards and we're going to unpack those. Robin, can you click? Okay, thank you. So we're going to determine, we're gonna build those assessments once we've decided that. Then question two says, how do we know if they've learned? Well, we're gonna look at that assessment data and we're going to determine areas of need from, from within the, that data. Then questions three and four, what do we do if they haven't learned? What will we do when they have? We're gonna build a plan based upon our data and we're going to intervene for every student that needs intervention and we're going to, ex to extend the learning for students that already have it. When we do interventions that intervene, that question three, we're going to make sure that, that we place students in need alike groups that are, that are um, flexible that they're, and they're fluid, but they are targeted to their specific need. It's very, that's one of the most critical pieces. Thank you, Robin, I think that you're up next. Muted. So some of these, um, we're gonna talk about common summative assessments again, just specifically, just to review some of the things that you've already heard. Common summative assessments are created by teacher teams. They're, giving, they're given at the end of unit um, once all of that instruction has been given. It, it pulls the targets back together to the complete standard and you're assessing the total standard. Remember on common formative assessments, you are assessing targets of the standard, but in your common summative, you're assessing the total standard together at its level of rigor, at its DOK level. The data that you use from a common summative assessment is used to create your tier two intervention groups. And those students should be able to reassess their common summative assessment once they have completed an intervention cycle. So you're going to give the common summative assessments. And for any student who is not proficient on their common summative assessment, those students go into tier two intervention groups. And within those groups, they have a cycle of intervention on that standard. Once they've completed a cycle of intervention, whether if that is a week or eight days or 10 days of intervention on those standards that they were not proficient on, they can go, they should be able to go back and take a reassessment on the common summative assessment they were given to see if now they're proficient. If you don't give them the chance to reassess, you'll never know if now they're proficient and proficiency is what we're looking to know. That's what we want to know from a common summative assessment. Are students proficient on that standard? Right. 
me. Robin, you're muted. Thank you, Faith. You want to align your instruction and your assessment. So you're going to identify your units of study. This, this is the um, order that you're going to do it. You're going to identify your units of study from your essential standards. Once you've got your essential standards and you've got your targets, then you're going to make your units of study. Uh, units of study typically here at our school are 15 school days. So 15 days of school typically identifies a unit of study here. Once you've made your, your teacher team has made their unit of study, has planned it, then they develop the assessments. They develop the assessments for the CSA and the CFA. Now, the reason we do the CSA first is because that's where you're assessing the full standard, but then they break those common summative assessments down and make common formative assessments from the targets. Now, remember, this is all in the planning period. No instruction has started yet. Once they have developed their unit of study, they developed their assessments and they have set proficiency levels for those assessments, then they're going to develop their pacing guide. Actually, what day they're going to teach what and what days they're going to have for um, reteaches or when they're, you know, planning the full structure of the full 15 days of teach. Then that team is going to start pulling resources for the teaching of that unit of study. And within that, they're going to go ahead and plan for tier two intervention. That's the students who are not going to be proficient at the end of the common summative assessment, the end of the unit. We're going to go ahead and make plans for intervention for when that is ready, when that happens, and they're going to plan for extension. Extension is this is for the students who are proficient on the CSA. So during the tier two time, when a classroom teacher is pulling their small groups for tier two intervention, you need to have something for your students who were proficient. What are they going to do? Well, that's the extension piece, and that's actually part of the Chris critical questions of what are we going to do if they don't know it and what are we going to do if they do. The extension piece is the piece for the students who were prof proficient on the common summative assessments and there needs to be a plan for them during that tier two time. All of this is done prior to beginning instruction on this unit of study. For some reason, you're muted again, Robin. I'm so sorry. I don't know what I'm doing that's doing that, but I am sorry. Stephen, if you can kind of help me stay unmuted, that'd be great when I'm pressing something that mutes myself. Um, this is a common summative assessment for sixth grade that actually came from my building. Um, this is over ratios, rates, and percent, so it's obviously a math common summative assessment. It's only a piece of that. I wanted you to see it. You'll see at the top, it's where students actually write themselves. It's a rubric for their own rating where students self-assess, and then the next rubric you see is the rubric for their actual performance on the assessment from the teacher. You'll see that the learning target, learning targets are put it are actually listed in the um, common summative assessment, then with the problems, um, the actual assessment questions are there below. And so you'll see 
um, that's a sixth grade common summative assessment. All right. This is a continuation of that same assessment. You'll see it on the next page. There's the, um, the next target. There is the rubric at the top and there are the assessment questions. And um, so this is just a continuation of that same common summative assessment. Now, when you think about after the assessment, what type of responses to the assessments do teachers need to have when you're focusing on that feedback? And Solution Tree will tell you that the feedback is critical. So there are two types of responses that teachers can have to assessments. They can give corrective instruction. So that's when the student under, misunderstands the um, how to uh, do that standard, like they just have a complete misunderstanding about what the standard is saying, or if they understand the standard but are having trouble um, responding in a in a le to a level of proficiency about the standard, and that's intervention. So a teacher can respond either through corrective instruction or intervention. It's most important that when you're giving these responses or this feedback, that they are timely. They have to be not, you can't wait two weeks until you have everything graded. It has to be quick. They have to get that response back quickly. And then they need a specific response. I know when I was teaching 20 years ago, I might put a uh, 87B on the top of a test and put, good work. Well, that is not specific. That teacher, I mean, that student would have no idea what I meant. What was the good work? What wasn't the good work? What parts did they understand? Which parts did they not? And so that the feedback needs to be specific to that assessment and exactly what uh, feedback you want to give them. And then the teacher needs to guide them through it. Don't just hand it back for them to put it back in their desk like we've done for so many years or put in their folder or put in the trash can. They need to guide them through the uh, places that they are still having gaps in their, um, in their understanding. So when you're thinking about that feedback, um, you all recognize Hattie. He's, he's a um, very well-known um, research uh, entity in the education world. And he and William and Black both said, the engagement of students throughout the assessment process not only raises student achievement, but also powerfully propels students to their own learning, to own their learning. And so if you want students to have some skin in the game, you want them to care, you want them to be motivated, they have to be engaged in that assessment process. They have, if you saw at our assessments, they, on every assessment, they have a place at the top where they can uh, reflect on how well they think they did. On the back of assessments, sometimes once it's graded and we hand it back, we have students make a learning plan for their next steps and let the teacher know what they need. So they have to be involved in that. And then Drek in 2008 said, students who are clear on their strengths and their areas of need are more likely to believe in their potential to develop their abilities and continually improve. If they know these are my strengths and these are where I need help, they can focus in and it doesn't seem so overwhelming. So that feedback is critical. Um, this is a reflection example. I believe I pulled this out of a third grade. Um, so this, is, this would be the, the reflection on the back of the assessment once they've taken the assessment. This came off of a third grade test. The highlighting is what the student did. So students fill this out. 
So you will see this is over learning target number 22. I can compare fractions based off of their size. So the students look at the questions and we code our questions on our assessments in third grade for the different targets. So students that are questions that had a um, circle beside them or one type of question, the half triangle or another question and the square is another question, that's coding simply for the teacher. But we want the kids to look and see if on, on those questions, did you know what you were doing? Did you follow directions? I didn't set my problem up correctly. I made a calculation mistake. I made a modeling mistake or I struggled with my justification. And they have to go back through their assessment once it's graded and look at these and determine where they were on it. Of course, the I pulled one that the student knew what they were doing on each of those questions. So then their results were they determined I need to improve on this target. Um, if they were a zero or a one on the rubric, if they were a two, they determined they need to improve on the target or three, they've got it. I can extend, I can go to extension on this because I've got it. So then we actually asked them to write down what their strength on the assessment was and what their area of growth needs to be. And on this child, he put that his strength was, it's a boy, he knew how to identify equivalent fractions. So that was his strength. And because he, oh, oh my goodness, because he gets to extend, sorry, um, he decides uh, what he needs to do, how he wants to extend. So he gets to pick. He's gonna become the part of a peer support team for other kids. He wants to play bump and he wants to play four in a row. That's how he's gonna extend on that target. I'm assuming those are, um, as those are apps on their computer that the teacher has chosen that they can use for extension. Uh, the thing he didn't choose was max out this skill on Khan Academy. So he didn't choose that one. But you can see there are also, if you need to improve, you've got to pick the way that you're going to improve on that assessment. So that's an example of a reflection example. And we have reflections on the back of all of our CSAs. All right. Well, the way you're going to track this, or let me just say the way we track it. So students have their own tracking sheet. This is a particular tracking sheet for third grade. Every third grader um, has this for both literacy and math. You'll see that this is over the strand properties of operations, which would be math. And um, what they do, you can see at the bottom, there's learning target 16, 17, 18, 19. Um, the key is you can see if it was a CFA or a CSA. You can also see if they've had an extra try. We keep these all digital on their computer, but the students are responsible to keep them. So after every, every CSA and CFA, they are directed to go into their folder and log their um, proficiencies or where they are so that the students are completely aware at all times on every single target where they are within literacy and math. I just wanted to show you that as an example. All right, grading. I want you to think about some things about grading. Here at Spradling, we are complete standards-based grading. Um, our district is not standards-based grading, but they are expressing that they're wanting to move that way district-wide, but we exclusively do it here. Um, what I want you to know about grading is you don't have to grade everything. You do not have to grade a practice, homework, and you don't have to even grade CFAs. Some of my teachers, depending on what they have, they have two piles and they'll take those papers and they'll look at them and they'll say, this one's proficient, this one's not. And they'll put them in two piles and they will literally make some determinations from the two piles where they didn't just sit down and grade every single thing. So you don't have to do that anymore. Another thing here is we never average. We don't average anything because all we care about is proficiency on specific 
standards. And so we don't take standard one, two, and three and average those together and get an average for the student. We, perf we report proficiency on every standard. And so we don't average anything ever. Um, redos after on CSAs are important after they went through the intervention cycle because we want to see, are they making gains within the intervention cycle? If they're not, they can go through more than one intervention cycle because why? All we care about is that student becoming proficient on the standard, that is our goal. And then we only count the latest attempt toward proficiency. So let's say a student takes the test and they are not proficient. So what are we going to do? The C I'm talking about the CSA. They're going into tier two intervention. They're gonna go into a tier two intervention for those standards that were on that test. Once they've went through a cycle of intervention, they're going to retest. And we're hoping, and almost always, they become proficient on that second attempt. If they're not proficient, they go into another cycle of intervention, but let's say they are. Well, now I've got an assessment where they were not proficient, and I have an assessment where they are proficient. I've already told you, we're not going to average those two together and get a score. We're only going to take the score of where they're proficient. Now that really bothers teachers. They don't like that. And they say, but oh my goodness, so you're just gonna let the other go. Well, let me tell you about why that's important. When you were first learning to ride a bike and you were on that bike the first day, well, you got on it and you fell off and you got back on it and you fell off. And the next day you got back on it, you rode a little further and then you fell off. And then the next day you rode a little further and you fell off. And then eventually you got on that bike and you rode it. Now, as an adult, I can ride a bike, I can. Does it matter that all those times prior to me riding the bike, where I couldn't ride the bike, does that matter? Does it count? Do I have a low average now, right this minute of being a bike rider because all the other times I fell off the bike? No, all that matters is that right now I can ride a bike and I'm proficient at it. That's why we don't count all the times they're not proficient. All we care about is working toward proficiency. Now, I know for a lot of you, that's going to be like, I don't agree with that. That's not okay. That's not what we do. And that's okay. If nothing else, if I'm just planting the seed for you to think about, that will be a big win for me. Um, we only record in our grading system and report to parents on report cards, CFAs and CSA data. We do not report any other data. We never put in points for if you brought a canned good for the canned food drive, or if you got that field trip permission slip signed, or if you remembered to bring this in for class, or if you come prepared, or if you, you contributed to classroom today. We don't get points for any of that because that doesn't tell me are they proficient on a standard or not and really that's all that matters all the other things that you get points for that are outside of that um continuum is you are watering down grades you are putting things in there saying making a statement about where a child is in math or literacy when really some of the things you gave them points for don't have a thing to do with that. So I would challenge you to start rethinking some of that if you're doing it. We only record and report CFA data and CSA data because that is truly aligned with the standard. Also, Robin, can I jump in for just a second, Robin? Just because we, we do things a little bit differently, but it's still our goal is still exactly the same. We wanna make sure that students have mastered each of those learning targets 
up through the essential standard. And so we do things very similarly, but just a little bit different. And I think that's okay. Everything that Robin is saying is, is right on, especially I love the analogy about the bicycle and falling off. But I, for us, what we're looking for when we, when we report, we also um, use standards-based grading. And what's so great about that is that it is actually based upon evidence. And so instead of us just looking at the, the summative assessment or those formative assessments, those formative assessments are helping us to know where students are in their learning throughout the unit, while the summative is to see where they are at the end of the unit. We're putting all of those pieces together and looking at the whole body of evidence to see where has a student we can see at the beginning kind of where they started by keeping by tracking that data. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're putting a score on them, but we are tracking it to see the, the progression of learning that's uh, that's occurring. And so once a student is able to show mastery, whether that is, you know, for, with the CFA and they can do it consistently or whether it is after they've gone to tier two intervention, then it, it really doesn't matter. We just want to see that we have moved from um, where a student has it mastered and then we've moved to mastery on a consistent basis. So even a summative assessment for us, we look at it in the terms of that is one moment in time. So ideally, yes, a student is going to be able to show mastery of it. However, maybe they had a bad day. Maybe they're not feeling well. So that's one moment in time for us. So we look at the whole body of evidence and we want to be able to see that that progression from not understanding or not have mastered it to mastery. So we're fortunate in the fact that we're, we don't have to put letter grades on it or number grades that we can actually just look and say and determine, okay, we've got all this evidence that supports that this student has, has now achieved mastery, just like the bicycle. We couldn't ride it. We we maybe rode it a little ways, but fell off. Rode it a little ways, fell off until we got really good at it consistently. And so it's that same thing. It's the whole body of evidence that we're looking for. So I think that um, you can look at it from a little bit different perspectives and that kind of depends upon the expectation maybe of your district. So I just wanted to, to bring that up because I know we're just a little bit different, but our end goal is exactly the same, Robin. Um. I think the things you're talking about is the body of evidence of learning. And we do keep all of those things. They are the body of evidence so that when we have our report card out for our, our parent and we're going over that with them and we're looking at um, essential standard, whatever, you know, R2134. And when we're looking at that, we have a body of evidence documents that support what the grade is. However, we don't record those in the grade book We're re because they may or may not be practices, homework, those types of things um, may or may not be strictly aligned to this standard as much as the CFAs and CSAs. So we key, it is important to utilize all of that um, body of evidence of learning, and we do that as well. We just don't record it. I'm only talking about grading at this point. So the other thing that's a little different about us is, um, and I know this is definitely not widespread in the state, but our grading scale is balanced. And so we don't have the traditional 90 to 100, 89 to 90. Because of that, there are 10 point gaps in between a all the way through D, you have a 10 percentage point um, opportunity to make one of those scores, the increments, but for an F, you have a 50% or 59% increment um, chance of having an F. And so you, the scale is very off balance between all the way from A to F. So we have balanced our grading scale to where there are 20% increments in, in between each letter grade or rubric um, number. And so it's just a little different. It's just something for you to think about. Okay, 
And so if you have questions, and we're going to look at the Q&A here in just a minute, um, these are places that you can contact us, and we would love for you to contact us um, individually. And we don't mind spending time with you. Both of our schools are national model schools, and uh, we'd love to spend some time talking about what you do um, or what you've got going in your school or any way that we can help with that. So here is uh, both of our email addresses. Um, both of these phone numbers are our building numbers. Um, so you can definitely, our secretaries can hunt us down and find us. I also wanna do a shout out about the Arkansas Collaboration Project. Um, I want you to know that if you've got a grade level team in your building and they, your building's trying to do the PLC process and they're kind of stuck. Maybe they have a little bump in the road about picking their essential standards or, hey, maybe they've got a bump in the road about assessments. Um, there, there is a place that you can go on the ADE website, the DESI website, under, I think it's under professional learning communities, so go there. And then there's a place for, I think it's called collaboration project. Is that it, Missy? Collaboration project. Seems project like. collaboration. Collaboration. You can click on that link and your school can sign up to get a one-on-one -on -one personal uh, one-hour Zoom with the state team at that level. So if you have a state team, let's say they're fifth grade and they wanna talk about assessments with the state team, um, the state grade level team that's fifth grade, you fill out that form and we'll get you set up. They meet once a month and we'll get your team set up with them and we'll do a Zoom where they can talk to them about their, their personal uh, things going on at their schools and how we how it's being done at other schools to give them ideas and support. It's such a great thing. So please, I encourage you, go on there and have your teams go on there and sign up to meet with these state grade level teams. They are teachers. They're not necessarily meeting with administrators. They're meeting with other teachers at that grade level. So it's teacher to teacher, which is really great. And the ones I've set in on have been amazing. So, all right, let's look at the Q&A. Missy, do you have a way to open those up? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Robin, the first one I think is going to be directed to you because it's asking about the reflection time and how long that takes for your teachers. Okay, so the reflection time on the back of those assessments. Um, they have, they schedule in a day on their, not a whole day, but like a day of um, reflection after an assessment for the students because they go back over the assessments, a uh, whole group, and they talk about it. And it's during that time that they have the students do those reflections. I'm guessing the students spend about, at this point, because they do it every time they know how to do it. I'm, I'm guessing they spend about 15 minutes doing that one day after the CSA. Now the one on the CFAs where they just do a quick uh, rubric across the top takes seconds, so. You have a, there's another question in there that both of you can address. Uh, you mentioned at the start that the CSAs pull the targets back together to assess the whole standard. I noticed on one of the CSA samples, a learning target, not standard, was listed at the top. Do you still assess target by target on the CSA? I was thinking questions would be standard by standard rather than target by target once you reach the CSA. Oh, wow, that's a really great question, Tyler. So here's, here is the thing. On our common uh, summative assessments, and Faith can definitely answer for where she is because within the PLC process, a lot of times there's a lot of different ways to do things. Um, Solution Tree would tell you that it is important on the CSA, somewhere on that CSA, that you pull that standard completely back together and have the student do the standard in complete entirety of what that standard says. Um, because sometimes they can do the targets in isolation, but they can't pull it back together. So on our assessments, 
they do have questions that are the that do pull that standard back together, but they also still have a targeted um, within compartments of the assessment. They put those targets in there because it's really easy then when they grade it to see which targets those kids are having the most trouble with to go into tier two intervention. And that's why they're categorized like that on the assessments. That um, suggestion was made to us by one of, uh, by Angie Freeze, one of the assessment people at Solution Tree. She helped us set up our format. And that's why it's like that. But I assure you, it's most important that the kids do have an opportunity on the common summative assessment to assess that standard as a whole at some point on that assessment. Yes, I, I'm just going to add just a little bit because we're, we kind of are on, well, I mean, we are on the same page. We, we know that you bring the standard back together and you want to make sure that students are able to, to um, that they've mastered all components of it. The reason it's so beneficial to go back and look at individual targets, it's really more about, instead of just individual targets, it's more about the learning progression and the requirements in order to be successful at this level, you've got to know all of these things. And so we build those assessments so that they're scaffolded uh, within the assessment to be really, really specific and intentional. We do it with intentionality because we want to make sure that when we go to intervene, we are, we're not intervening on something broad topic. We're going to intervene on the specific area where a student might go astray a little bit. So that way we can move them and we can fill that gap quicker instead of putting them somewhere where they're not quite ready for or putting them in a group that 75% of, they know 75% of the standard. It's just this one uh, component that they're still struggling with. And so we really kind of build that, it's that, it's that ladder of learning, that progression that we're really looking at. And we try to be really specific and targeted just so that we can uh, work smarter instead of harder. I so we're going to do the work anyway. Yeah, I totally agree with that. All right, are there any other questions? Well, I think I answered the other question on the recording. Uh, someone wanted to share the recording with their staff and it will be uploaded to the PLC page on the DESI website. Uh, just give me a day or two to do that, just so that the recording can be downloaded. And then I will also include the PowerPoint on that uh, same page. So if you're looking for that, it will be there. Well, we have really enjoyed getting to visit with you today, spend a little time with you. I hope you found it beneficial. Um, we enjoy helping and supporting our uh, colleagues across the state, even the ones we don't know, please feel free to contact Faith or I or Missy, any of us, and we will do anything we can to help you. Absolutely. We're going to, they're going to stay on for a few minutes and answer any questions. I do say that we have one more question. Uh, before we move forward, I do just want to share some dates with you. We've got on April the 28th, Mike Mattis will be presenting a virtual a conference on from nine to three that day. You can register on the ESC works and it's on tier one for RTI on May 13th. He will be presenting on tier two and on May 19th, he'll be presenting on tier three. So go on to the ESC works website and you can register for those there. And then the question that is up is, do you assess every standard from the unit or only what is identified as essential? Um, and don't, don't apologize for the questions. They're great. Not at all. No, no, no. Uh, read it one more time, Missy. Do you assess every standard from the unit or only what is identified as essential? Okay, so um, this, this may be another place that um, Faith and I have uh, ways that we do it different. Here's how we do it here. Um, we only assess essential standards. We teach every standard. Every single standard is taught in the grade level that the state of Arkansas says is a standard for that grade level. However, um, there are standards that we consider are essential, are boulders, and those are the standards that we assess 
and we demand proficiency on. Um, the essential standards are what become our guaranteed Bible curriculum. There's the whole curriculum from the state, and we do teach all of them. We just don't teach standards that are not essential. We don't teach to the depth or breadth of the essential standards, and we don't assess them on our common summative assessments or our common formative assessments. So that's what we do. That's, that's us too. We may place other standards on our units, but we place them in as supporting standards. And, that, and more than anything, they're there to serve as a reminder that make sure that we pull this in because it's important or it's part of the, it's part of the scaffolding needed in order to be successful on the essential standard that we have. We, the whole reason that we are assessing is really just to make sure that students are mastering. And so when we build those assessments, we focus on those essential standards so that students who don't have it, we can move them to the proper interventions uh, and um, focus that that's needed. And so we make sure it's those guaranteed standards, just like Robin said. I think the great thing about the great thing about being a PLC is that we all have the same end goal, but within the process, there are there are some some things that we're really tied on, but there are some things that we have enough, you know, that we're able to have autonomy and do um, what works best as long as we are answering those four critical questions with integrity and we are really focusing on what is it that we expect and and making sure that those students have learned those things. So. Thank y'all. I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. And uh, Robin and Faith, if you'll stay on for just a second and see if there are any other questions, but the rest of you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining us and be looking for commissioner's memos for upcoming webinars. Thank you. Hi guys. Y'all have another question in the box. I'm gonna...